Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar, Building Blocks to Think Like a Driller. This event, brought to you by National Driller, is the second part of National Driller's Drill EDU series. I'm your moderator, Jeremy Verdusco, editor of National Driller. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to extend a huge thank you to our sponsors who have helped make this presentation possible. VersaDrill, Whole Products, and the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at Western Michigan University. Thank you. Today's presenter is drilling instructor Brock Yorty. He has experience training with the United States Military, Department of Labor, Western Michigan University Hydro Field Camp students, and drillers from around the world. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Science from Western Michigan University. Brock started his professional career as a drilling fluids engineer for Bayroid Industrial Drilling Products, where he realized his passion for training. As a mud man for Bayroid IDP, he worked with all methods of drilling, including water well, geothermal, geotechnical, tunneling, construction, HDD, wireline coring, and large diameter shaft drilling. In 2010, Brock assisted in developing a water well training program for the United States military. In 2015, he started working with the Department of Labor International Operators Union on a program that teaches pre-apprentice and journeyman operators to become helpers and drillers. Brock continues to train new drillers all over the world and consult on projects that provide water for the global water crisis. He actively works with the U.S. Air Force Red Horse Drilling Units. Brock is the Business Development Manager and Drilling Engineer for Midwest GeoDrill. You can read Brock's articles on drilling in National Driller Magazine. Brock continues to teach and is working on publishing his first book on how to become a driller, set to be released in late 2019. If you have a question during the presentation, please submit it in the Ask Brock a Question tab and be sure to check out the handout section for the PDF of today's presentation. Today's presentation is being recorded and archived on www.nationaldriller.com slash drilledu. And now I'm excited to turn it over to Mr. Brock Yorty. Hello everybody, I'm Brock Yorty. This is Building Blocks to Think Like a Driller. Uh, today we're going to talk about communication, safety, the drilling process, drilling methods, and getting the most out of a site. For all the great drillers that are out there participating today, think about how we interact with our uh, new people on site and uh, regulators and engineers that, and uh, geologists, hydrogeologists that come to the field and uh, maybe don't get to be on site as much as we'd like them to be or see the drilling process. Uh, I really appreciate your time and let's get into this. <clears throat> the driller. You can see on the far left there, uh, the rig, there's no driller. Where is the driller? You know, we're pumping a well off. Um, it's, a, it's a good completion. And below that, you can see some of my friends from the Red Horse getting ready to set casing. Then we move to the middle and we can see some foam drilling with the United States Army in Arizona and a former NGWA president doing a mud rotary hole. And then on the far right, there's little Brock Yorty watching his father. You can see that in 1984, the safety standards were uh, not quite what we're at today. But you can see there's much different levels of job sites and what's happening. And, uh, you know, a driller is the, the captain, the pilot. You know, he is the man or woman that is steering this vessel. And uh, as he gets new information from uh, ground control or uh, weather or something coming up, he changes his course, right? And uh, the same as on the driller platform, as something vibrates or uh, we, we have a change in formation. So everything from the driller, that's where the job site starts. And that proper communication through the rest of the job is very critical. It 
So uh, communication starts and stops with the driller's platform, right? Drillers are aware of all processes and communicates the team and what tasks are required next. You know, he's thinking about we're going to be setting casing soon or this core recovery is going to come back and we're going to have to start these situations. So, you know, as uh, stepping out on a job site as the driller or somebody that is going to start thinking like a driller, you know, that communication, it's uh, strong, candid and effective, right? So it's strong because we have a lot of moving parts and so we're going to have definitive answers on what's going to happen. It's candid because there's danger zones, there's things happening and we don't have time to just say, whoa, wait a minute, let's step over to the side. There is times for that in training situations, but in the real life time, you know, we have to be a candid and then it has to be effective. It's got to be exactly what we need. And for somebody that needs to think like a driller and work with drillers, your communication should be the same. Uh, I need samples at every five feet. I expect this to happen today. Um, safety is going to be this importance, the same with the drillers. And it has to be effective communication between you, the driller, the drill crew. You know, thinking like a driller starts with understanding strong, candid, effective communication. Sure, you're going to meet drillers that uh, will take you under their wing and they're going to teach you things. And you're going to find drillers that are marathon runners, long distance marathon runners that has their crew, knows what needs to be done, but needs to be very short and direct to the point because there's a job to be completed. And the complexities of things that are going on down hole change rapidly. So effective communication, you know, it, it starts with drilling terminology. And from uh, us being right here on the east side of Michigan today, you know, uh, we say pop, you know, and the country says soda, uh, Coca-Cola, Coke. You know, our communication changes with where we are in the country, the type of equipment we're running, the methods that we're using from stocking caps to cowboy hats, we're gonna have different terms. So beyond terminology, you know, task communication, which can be a look at, a, at another colleague and uh, we're gonna trip pipe now. Or it can be, this is the task we're going to be, could be just a head nod and understanding those communications. Then the process, you know, what do we expect to happen today? Uh, this is the method we're going to use. And then finally, you know, drillers expectations. This is for you as thinking like a driller and our driller. What are we going to complete today? And we'll go into that further as we get into this presentation. Well, there's a lot of uh, terminology up there and our experienced guys are going, yep. And uh, some others are going, hey, I've, I've heard that or, What's tripping? You know, uh, the big thing is, is if you look on the left, you can see a tubular mast top head rig, you know, uh, drilling a mud rotary hole. And on the right, we have a table drive rig that's got a Kelly and draw works. It's a lattice derrick. And uh, we're gonna get into a little bit of terminology, but the best thing I can say, if you don't understand what was just said, ask you know, because we have a lot of different ways that we say the same thing on a job site. So uh, simplicity, you know, we have a top head drive rig, top down hydraulic feed head that provides rotation and feed pressure for advancement and retraction of rods. Then we have a table drive rig, fixed rotation system that utilizes a Kelly rod or bar that is lowered and raised by a rig's draw works. But wait, top head drive has a table too. Yes, but it's not feeding from there. So that, those are the first times that we can say, wait a minute, I, I thought you said we had a uh, top head rig and you're talking about a table. You know, it's effective communication with the driller. Mast, you know, a two piece section mast that is going to feed our top head or, uh, you know, it's, it's exactly what we saw on that first page. You know, and Derek, it's created with rangular, or rectangular or square cross sections. You know, and uh, really it comes back to the rig manufacturer and the region we're in, if we're gonna call it a mast or a derrick. You know, a pullback. Now this is when we get into really project scope. You know, the amount of weight a rig can lift off bottom of the hole. You know, and this is dependent on not only tooling assembly, bottom hole assembly, drill rods or drill collars, but the geology we get into and how effective we're hole cleaning. And a pullback is very critical to what we're going to be able to do at the end of the job. Sure, gravity is going to help us get to bottom, but can we lift that stuff back up? Pull down, the amount of weight we can exert on tooling, bits, 
um, how we can break up geology in a downward motion. You know, and this is dependent on the size of the machine. Pull down is great, and sure, we want to have the most we can, but we have to think about rod flex and how we could deviate a hole or how other things are affected. So sometimes we don't use pull down. You know, we're letting the weight and the tooling do our cutting, but we need it to be able to break up harder geologies. Rotational torque and speed. Now this is where we really start to separate what our capabilities of our rigs are. You know, a wire line coring rig is gonna need much higher rotation than say a traditional table drive rig drilling in cobbles. You know, it's going to be very dependent on the geologies and bits required, you know, for the different amount of torque or speed. High torque is going to give us slow rotation and uh, high rotation is gonna give us very low torque. And knowing our expectations of those machines and thinking like a driller starts with understanding what I need to cut. Maximum fluid volume output, my pump capacity. As I'm called on projects with uh, my friends with the Red Horse or local uh, colleagues that I've made throughout this industry, you know, one of the first things I ask is what is our pump capacity? And I'm not talking mud pumps, I'm talking what can I exert for fluid volume downhole to help bring solids up out of the hole? And we're gonna get into that, but it's very important to think of fluid volume output as air, as drilling mud, as water, as foam, and what we have. You know, in a drill bit, this is very self-explanatory, right? It's going to uh, give us what we can cut, you know, understand how quickly we can go down hole, and we're gonna talk about bits today. You know, and then, wow, I just threw up a bunch of these, and these are really just for a reference, you know, it's very project equipment, region specific, depending on if I'm running a rig from uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, or somewhere out in the Western United States, how we talk about it, you know, feed up and down on a rack and pinion machine or a top head drive is very similar to hoist that we're going to see on a table drive. Drill pipe can be called drill rod or drill stem, you know, or we talk about Kelly bar, you know, and it's just uh, starting to look at this terminology and understanding this doesn't make sense. Ask, you know, tripping out. <laughs> I mean, we got our HR people that are going, wait, wait a minute, is this Colorado? You know, really, we're, we're thinking about extracting drill rod out of the hole or tripping back in. You know, these are the things we think about. Solids control is a fluids recycler or a mud cleaner. You know, if you don't get the terminology, the best thing to do is have a candid discussion about it. So then we jump into job site task communication. You can see we got a, we got a rig that's bringing in a drill rod there in uh, the middle of the desert. We have on the right, we have a cathodic project that the driller is... Uh, watching the vac truck clean up a mud cleaner, and uh, he's getting ready to add some more rods. And we got a water well with the Western Michigan University guys on the side there watching, you know, and you can see where the communication starts. If I'm new to the job site, I wanna be able to understand what's happening and be out of the way. So, you know, task communication, you have to ask the driller, hey, are you gonna let me know when we're about to add rods or set casing? You know, it's very, uh, very important to understand what tasks are going to happen next. And to be able to think like a driller, we have to first understand what tasks are gonna happen and have that conversation. You know, and then we have the project's scope. Are we gonna be on this job for a day like the upper left-hand corner there with the mud rotary machine? We go to the far right and we're in the Atagama Desert on a thousand meter hole. You know, we got foam drilling. We have a 20 foot diameter reverse circulation hole there. How much cuttings are going to come out? You know, now this is where we get into expectations of a job and how we're going to work it. So drillers' expectations. You know, in any other presentation I've done, we start with safety. But communication trumps safety today because we have to understand what's going to happen and have that conversation before we can get into what do we need for safety. So if I'm thinking like a driller, my driller expectations are this. You know, job site safety and safety considerations. What's happening today? What slips, trips, and falls? What else could happen? Is there traffic? Um, is there inclement weather coming? Then next, you know, what's the goal for the day? As the driller, that's in their mind, right? For you as thinking like a driller, it's great to walk out there and be able to say, what's our goal? You know, I've, I've had colonels say, 
how the hell did we just spend six weeks out here when we thought this was going to be a three-week project? Or I've been on environmental jobs where we've gotten into cobble and gravel and we're not getting the samples we thought we were going to. You know, understanding what the goal is changes from job to job and what we find in the ground. You know, drilling is one of these great processes where we start to understand the unknown. We drill down to understand what's there. And short of kicking the dirt off the top of the ground, that's as far as we can see. Then goal for project completion. If I'm out there, are we going to complete today? What is the goal for today? And then when do we expect to be completed? Then for seeing issues, you know, that's easy. Uh, we got a wetland over here. We, uh, we need to be cognitive of our neighbors next door and uh, where our drilling process is going to be in our traffic. And then unforeseen issues. Well, that, that doesn't make much sense. How can we have a conversation about unforeseen issues? Well, we can. We can know in the United States you know, what local artesians or gases we could encounter. You know, um, are there rattlesnakes on the job site? You know, there's a lot of things that we can talk about as a collective group. And then other information that's going to be good for the day. Uh, you know, there's a noise ordinance and we need to shut down by four o'clock today. But these are the things as a driller and thinking like a driller, we need to understand. You know, good communication promotes successful execution. You can see on this job in uh, Western Illinois, we, uh, we started, the expectations was as we ended this job, it would look like that we were never there. And you can see by understanding those expectations and having good communications with uh, our customer and the engineering crew, we were able to get to that point. And that's where it really is about what is expected, what can we do, and picking the right method and working together in a collaboration. So safety, you know, when I worked for Halliburton and I've lived this way for the rest of my career, safety is a condition of employment. And you go, wait a minute, uh, I hear safety starts with me and, uh, you know, let's have a safe day and go back to our family. You know, it's not just about being unsafe and being kicked off a job site. If we get hurt, we can no longer be employed, you know. Uh, how is that going to impact us? So I really love the saying, safety is condition of employment. So minimum protective equipment required, you know, good fitting work clothing, good head protection, eye protection. We got a lot of rotating stuff going on. Foot protection for crushing, hearing protection or hearing conservation, hand protection. You know, uh, if you're going to go over and pick up some augers that have been laid on the ground, or you're going to handle a sample that says has um, some something bad in that sample, you know, you want to make sure you're wearing the right hand protection. Then respiratory protection from if I'm on a quarry and we're, you know, we're blast holing or uh, I'm next to a bunch of guys that are mixing coke breeze or mud, I need to make sure I'm safe. And then fire retardant clothing, you know, if I'm going to be on an oil and gas job site or another job that we know that there's going to be gas, do I have FR on? So hard hats, and these are uh, some students from the Western Michigan Hydro Field Camp. You know, uh, when we talk about hard hats, we're looking at plastic and non-metal construction. You know, if I'm thinking like a driller and I'm going on a job for the first time, you know, I want to have a good hard hat. And uh, we can no longer be like the John Wayne movie Hellfighters and have those awesome, you know, aluminum hats. We have to use plastic, non-metal, something that's not conductive. So it, next, it needs to fit properly and face the proper direction. Sure, it looks cool to have a hard hat on backwards. And there's hard hats that you can wear forwards or backwards. And there's some that you can't. The ones that you can wear both ways were tested that way. So we want to make sure if you decide, uh, I'm going to wear my hard hat on backwards, that it's, uh, it's been impact tested for this front part of your brain. You know, beyond that, I, you know, as a, an intern and a new guy, and when I was a kid from my father's company, you know, hard hats, showed where we'd been, you know, showed our legacy or our experience. And for young guys and girls, that's important to be able to go look at this safety sticker, look at this project I've been on. But, you know, life cycle is two years. So we have to replace them and start over. Think about it. We don't wear boots with holes in them, right? Like it, that would tell me that I've walked through these rocks and I've done this thing. Do you want a hole in your head by having an ineffective hard hat? It's something to think about. Hearing protection is now called hearing conservation, right? Job sites are going to be loud. There's a lot of impacting, and you want to be able to hear 
your grandchildren when you retire out of this industry. So thinking like a driller starts with understanding that, you know, 85 to 90 decibels, you know, eight hours workday max. You know, beyond that, if you look at it, 95, 100, 105, look at how quickly those permitted work hours start damaging our hearing. At 115 decibels, we have 15 minutes before we've done severe damage that is going to just continue to hurt our hearing. I love this saying. I had a mentor on one of my first projects that I was on that said, hey, if we start talking and I start to shout, you understand that our noise levels are beyond 85 decibels and uh, we need to have hearing protection in. You know, and this is the statement that says hearing protection recommended. We need to have hearing protection. Dust mask. Mesothemioma is a big deal in our industry. And uh, what we've realized is it's about, you know, poor hygiene and uh, situations. Industrial hygienists have put on boxes. They've uh, had guys and girls, you know, perform with this stuff. And we have all of this dust flying around. Sure, maybe there's some issues with uh, I'm, I'm upwind. It's not a big deal. But we really have to think about that fine particulate and then think about how that hygiene affects us. Did I uh, inhalate all of that material after the job while I was uh, eating lunch or I climbed into the truck? Pull that filter out of your truck and see how much drilling fluid dust and job site dust is in there because you're inhalating that stuff and it's a bad deal. So an N95 dust mask is just the start having the right fit. Site visitation safety. Thinking like a driller. We can't stand on the platform with the driller. Maybe they'll ask us to come on up. But the biggest thing I want you to think about is I want to stand to the outside of the driller. So that's the control panel and on the outside. You know, if the drill panel's on the left, that's standing on the far left. If we were in the oil and gas industry, this uh, entire control panel that we look at, rods rotating the table, the hoisting, would all be bright yellow and would be a danger zone. And as it was operating, we wouldn't be there. In the mining industry, we cage that up. We separate everybody from the danger zone. In many industrial drilling applications, we haven't gotten there yet. And it's very hands-on depending on the equipment. So the first thing to think about is you want to be on the outside of the driller. You can still ask questions. He's cognitive of you being there. She knows where you are. And then if we go to the right, or the left, wherever the helper site is, you know, he's, he and she have tasks to do. So you have to think about that. Uh, beyond that, think about the danger zone. If it's 20 foot drill rods, you have a 20 foot fall radius. You know, we're hoisting tooling up uh, overhead. There's pits and trenches that we need to think about. So if I'm new to the job site or I'm evaluating for a day, I ask the driller and we have a conversation about where's my safe zone. That safe zone is gonna be 25 foot away and uh, that's where I'm going to do my sample evaluations. I'm going, to I'm going to use that time to take phone calls, photos, document, and now I'm out of the path and those uh, men and women can work safely without worrying about where I'm at and what could possibly happen. You know, there's a lot of complex tasks that are going on site. Rotation, if we have to hit an emergency stop on a piece of equipment, it doesn't just immediately stop. Some do, many don't. So if you get hung up or something happens, there's still going to be a full rotation before you can be saved. And there's a lot of damage that'll happen. So if you see these two photos with uh, instructor Tom Howe and uh, Chad Yorty with Bayroid on the outside, you know, they're evaluating from a safe spot. And that's what we want to think about. If I'm a new driller and I have new people on site, you know, I want to tell them the same thing. Hey, stay to the outside of me. Then on a job site, beyond that, situational awareness. You know, we have slips, trips, and falls situation. We have a mud pit. You fall in a mud pit, maybe your pride's just hurt, or it's eight foot deep and we have to figure out how to save you. You know, uh, you can see the center photo is a wireline cording project in Tonopah, Nevada. We had rattlesnakes, we had a big incline where we needed to make sure the trucks were chalked properly so they couldn't roll on top of us. We had a lot of things going on and you needed to know where your escape path is. So my situational awareness when I'm on site evaluating is where's my safe zone? Where can I exit from? If I run away from this machine from a catastrophic failure, am I going to trip? Am I going to fall into the pit? So thinking like a driller, the driller on the platform knows where he's going. He knows where his helper's going. You knew, need to know where's my out. 
You can see these job sites, how quickly they change. And uh, you know, at the end of a job when we're producing water out of the ground in the desert, you know, we get celebratory, but we still have to think about what else is going on? What could I get hurt on? So beyond that, you know, from a safety standpoint, what is the driller thinking about? You know, three essential questions. What can I drill into? Man-made obstructions, man-made subsurface obstructions, what natural subsurface obstructions? You know, so, so natural, we can get logs most of the places we are in the world. Uh, we start thinking about sinkholes, lost zones, fragile formations, um, artesian flow, natural gas, you know, other gases. If we think about visible man-made obstructions, above ground utilities, buildings and structures. What is the right of way? What are my rules for the right of way? You know, other structures. I say before we drill, we must look up. Before we drill down, we must look up. Seems like Dr. Seuss would say something like that, right? Looking up can save our lives. Looking at where these power lines are. Now, if I'm new to the industry, I'm, I need to think like a driller, I'm doing a site evaluation, I show up, I walk to the job site, I put that stake in the ground, perfect time for you to take a moment and go, all right, I'm standing on this driller's platform. I look up and I look around, what do I see? What, what could happen? So beyond that, we go to subsurface man-made obstructions. Most of these we can get located, right? So we think about electric, gas, septic fields, abandoned structures. Wait, how are we gonna figure out about abandoned structures? Well, if I'm working an urban geothermal project in say Detroit, where I'm at today, and the job site that we're on is a big flat field with buildings all around me, I need to take a moment and go, wait, why isn't there a building here? What could we encounter? You know, in that top 20 to 40 feet that we drill is gonna tell us. You know, sometimes when the driller says, man, this drill's like steel, there's a good chance it's steel. So we need to think about those reclaimed areas and how that's going to affect our project. Over 20 reported strikes in 2018, and I've worked a lot this year with the pipeline companies, and, you know, they've said, you know, uh, our third-party strikes, we just, you know, we, we have to do better. And if you, uh, you Google that, you can look from rig fire to rig fire to projects to really bad things to fathers and sons getting burned up you know we just have to think about what's in the ground on a right of way and other places and make sure we contact our 811 in the united states you know in michigan it's miss dig you know illinois it's julie you know but understanding what's in the ground that can be located now that's not going to get us the utilities that aren't known you know that don't have tagging equipment but this is where we can start you know, so proper planning for a drill site. If I'm thinking like a driller, I'm calling my local utility locators. Before that rig shows up on site, or if I'm going to stick that stake to where I want that rig to be, I'm on a mining project and uh, we have a new exploration hole, and I'm gonna walk up this hill and I'm gonna walk around a corner and I need to look at all the trees and everything that rig's going to encounter as we drive off road. Same thing a driller should do when they show up, park it, walk the path of the rig. Then, you know, I'm gonna stand exactly in the borehole and I'm gonna look around and I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna look down and I'm gonna make sure I'm seeing everything that should have been very easy for me to see before I raise that mass and get into a danger zone. 10, my, ten minutes of site evaluation is priceless, guys. So we have a catastrophic failure and I'm the new person on site or I'm the driller at the table, what is my plan? You know, we don't think about this. We think about plugging into our uh, GPS on our phone and showing up on the job site and then pulling off into a rural area or maybe into a field or a forest area. I call 911 and it doesn't pick up my GPS location and my heart's racing and somebody has just had their arm taken off and we need to get an ambulance here as possible. I need to know crossroads. We need to get back to thinking about what crossroads am I going to be, how far off the road I'm going to be. Emergency action plans save people's lives. And sometimes you, being in that 25-foot excluded safety area, learning to think like a driller, you're the person most readily available to call 911. So you need to think about where are we going to go? Um, what if the call is dropped? Make sure you give your phone number. Clearly explain the emergency.
Say, uh, I need an ambulance. We have a fire. You know, and then beyond that, now I'm sitting in the middle of the field on an irrigation well, and I'm watching the fire truck and emergency vehicles go west of me. Do I have something reflective? Do I have a flag? Is there something that I can flash and say, hey, this is what's happening. We're over here. So think about an emergency action plan. And finally, before we have that stop, that uh, catastrophic issue, you should have a stop work authority on your job site where everybody, no matter what level of skill and newness to the job, can say, stop. This is an unsafe act. These prevent catastrophic events. They educate everyone. If I say, hey, stop, I don't, why are we using this to hoist with? We can step off to the side and we can have a candid conversation about this is the practice we use. We'd like you to stand over here. Or uh, maybe there was a distraction going on and nobody caught that the hoist plug wasn't completely screwed in. You know, uh, by all of us being able to say stop, we build trust. We have each other's backs. We say stop. And now I didn't have to say I'm sorry to my colleague or my customer's wife when I attend their funeral. You know, stop work authorities save lives. And I'll get off my soapbox now, but. Next time you see something you don't understand, it's a moment to say, stop, what's happening? So we get to the drilling process and methods. And uh, you know, if you were all in the audience right now, we could stop and we could say, hey, wait. And uh, uniquely, we're just plowing through this. So if you have any questions, it's a great time at the end to uh, throw those questions out or shoot me an email. Or better yet, just uh, talk to the National Driller folks and we can uh, start a Ask Brock or something like that. So the drilling process, how do I create a borehole? Open, stable, straight, straight in the direction that's desired. A gauge borehole, meaning that you know it's 12 inch from the beginning of the hole to the end. Is it clean? Did we get all the cuttings out? Can I put product into it? Can I extract product out? You know, these are the things I think about before I even understand what drilling method I'm going to use. How can I create a borehole that's open, stable, straight, gauge, clean, and gets me done and paid? So basic borehole creation. We have the feed pressure exerted by the rig. We have our bit rotating. It's creating cuttings. And we have a fluid moving those cuttings up hole. Maybe we're using dry augers and we're using the mechanical action to move those cuttings up hole. Still, we have Force exerted with rotation, creating cuttings that now we're going to manage by removing them out of the hole. If we don't remove them, it's not a hole. It's just a big mess that we've created. So how can I be successful? What affects my success? Types of soils. It's easy in the United States. I can pull logs anywhere and get a good idea of what I'm going to encounter. You know, uh, beyond that, what soil formation hydraulics? How easy is it for me to exert pressure that I end up creating a non-gauge hole or I force out or I frack? So downhole pressures are very important. And then depth to water. If it's five foot to water, it's gonna be a bad, bad place for me to use large air just by itself. How much water could I produce out of the ground? How are those gravels going to affect me in that borehole? So then I start thinking, what equipment do I have? Now, most of the time, the available equipment is going to be the right equipment choice. And there's times it's not, but beyond saying I have $100 million to build the most perfect drill rig that can do everything, I have to understand this is the piece of equipment I have. Now, what is its capabilities? That's gonna affect my success. So what does it have for rotation? If the job calls for wireline coring, and I have a machine that can't give me the rotation to give me effective cores, then I have to rethink what we're doing. You know, what is my pullback? If I'm going to 2,000 feet and my machine's incapable of pulling those rods off the bottom of the hole, what do I do? So, you know, looking at our rig capabilities is very important. And then beyond that, like I've said before, pumping capacity, mud pumps. How easily can I bring the cuttings out of the hole? What can I use air compressor? You know, downhole hammers, I have to have the right size compressor. So tooling is very important to our selection. Then we get into bit selections with cutting actions, hydraulics, and borehole diameter. So uh, I know right now Tom Howe has just slammed his pencil down on the desk and went, darn it, Brock, 
Why do you simplify this every time we get into this discussion? And it, it really comes back to we have non-reactive and reactive materials. There's times where uh, I've walked up and I've went, man, I wish I had my buddies. And I take an iPhone picture and I go, hey, what is this rock? And he goes, I don't know. I can't touch it or lick it or whatever those great geologists want to do. So I have to simplify it to what is the porosity of the material? So non-reactive, you know, water is going to flow through it. Um, it's permeable, you know, moving through the material. I, my issues are going to be cutting action. What size particles? Weight, hardness, abrasiveness. So my non-reactive solids, water moves through them. Rocks, sands, gravels, big solids. Then I have reactive. And man, you know, you slap your head the first time you get into a reactive situation with shale where it's swelling on you. We'll look at a photo like that. They're non-porous, tight pore space. You know, fluid doesn't move through them, correct? Reaction to water, they swell, they break down, they get sticky, they slough in the hole. What is my cutting action? What, uh, what's going to happen? There's a new term, boots. That's when uh, my clay comes around my tooling and I no longer can bring that fluid up hole and I create a frack out or I lose my hole. They create small solids. Drilling is a disruptive process. My mentor Jeff Blinn and Ed Anderson said that with Bayroid every day that I was an intern. It's a disruptive process. So we have to think as a driller and say, how do I minimize that impact? So if I'm going to do surgical drilling and do the most minimal impact possible and treat Mother Nature the way it should be treated, sand and gravel, I'm thinking about my borehole stability, hole erosion. You know, if I go in with a lot of fluid, do I start creating a bigger hole? Am I destabilizing uh, the ground? Uh, could we lose the rig? And then product installation issues or extraction. Can I get my material to bottom? Can I get water out of that? Can I get the core recovery that I want in this fragile formation? So, you know, rocks, you know, solid size, formation density, if it's pyrite, we're going to need something that's going to be able to carry a heavier material out of the ground. You know, erosion, penetration rate. Rock, if I don't have a high water table, man, that's the time that I want to grab a hammer and go. So surgical drilling for reactive soils. You know, clay and shale, we get stuck pipes, plugged bits, cutting size, boot formation, our... Fluid increase, our density increases when we're using a drilling fluid. You know, how do I make sure that those materials don't react? So, you know, I'm going to build a fluid that's going to work correctly for that in air, water, foam. Now, drilling method selection is going to be key to drilling in reactive soils. Bit selection, cutting action, you know, rotation speed, cutting type. How, how can I be minimal impact? Picking the right drilling method is really going to determine the success of my project. And again, sometimes we have the only available equipment on site. Now we have to understand its expectations and how I'm going to drill that to be safe. So we get beyond just thinking about our cutting actions. We need to think about the size and creation we're making. So if I'm just traditional rotary drilling, I'm going with the old school, you know, tricone bits that come in mill and button. And if you think of a mill tooth on the far left, the long teeth, you know, it's great for cutting reactive soils and making, you know, uh, manageable size cuttings. And if I look at the center bit, that's a button bit, it's great for cutting rock. Uh, Gord Bailey with Fleming College is retired now would say, think of a mill tooth bit like the front of your teeth and I'm biting an apple. I'm making big bites. I'm not going to chew that apple with the back of my teeth. It'll make little bites. You know, and think about that button bit like I'm eating that steak. While I eat that steak, you know, I grind it up with my molars. So think of a button bit like your molars and your mill tooth like the front of your teeth. I'm just going to hit on this, and I'd love for some input later, but jetted bits with the right technology is going to give you the best success. You can see we're keeping the cutting heads clean. We're able to stay. If we can't keep that cutter clean, we're going to eat up that bit. We're going to have issues. And this is what happens when we don't have jets in a bit. You can see we, uh, instead of making a manageable size cutting, what did we do? We made a big boot and we had to bring it out of the hole. Reactive soils. We can run drag bits, wing bits, claw bits, you know, bits that are going to help us break material up. It's just about rotation and penetration rate. So drag bits are a great piece of equipment to use. Again, communicating with your driller, 
thinking like a driller, okay, I'm using a drag bit today, my penetration rate's gonna have to slow down and I'm gonna have to have as much rotation as possible. The thing to think about bits is I'm trying to bring a manageable size cutting, one inch to a half an inch, out of the hole effectively. And that's what happens when uh, you use a claw bit, drag bit ineffectively. You can see the large cuttings. We had to bring the tooling out of the hole. Then we go to uh, a newer technology, and I love it when we say newer technology and the oil field's been using it for 50 years, but the rest of our industries, we, we're slow to react on some of these things. Um, PDC bits, polycrystalline diamond compact. You know, they're great for cutting rocks. They're great for cutting shales. You know, it depends on the bit and the technology. Um, yeah, it says diamond in it, so it can go from the typical tricone bit price of, you know, very inexpensive to very expensive. And it's understanding your tooling and how you're going to use it is how you stay successful. Downhole hammers. So I'm getting into competent rock now, and I have uh, the air compressor capacity to run these. Great way to have great penetration rates and good success. And it's about understanding your tooling limitations. So pumping equipment, compressor or mud. You can see on the far left, we have uh, mud rotary. Then we have straight air, and then we have foam. You can see cuttings are coming out of all of those. It's just about penetration rate and what we need to be successful. So successful cutting removal. We've looked at this slide before. Feed pressure exerted by the rig. That can be just letting the weight off the head and allowing it to lower as we rotate. We're creating those cuttings. Those cuttings have to blow past the bit face and come up the hole. It's very important to get them away from the bit face as large as possible. When they start to break down and degrade, we start having more issues. And then that's going to affect the rest of the job. Fluid is bumped down hole, drill solids come up out of the hole. So cuttings removal. In the States, uh, you know, we can think about this as a quarter, but uh, get a one inch size uh, piece of money and use, keep that in your pocket and think about, this is the size cutting I wanna create. Now, if we get into a wireline coring situation with diamond impregnated bits, we're doing a much smaller size cutting, correct? So the idea is to bring the most intact size cutting out of the annulus you have, and the annulus being what my bit's cutting and how much space I have between the borehole wall or my inner tube to bring the cuttings up out of the hole. So target uphole velocities for you know, traditional rotary machines. Water-based drilling fluids, mud, drilling mud, right? 60 to 150 feet per minute. Then we look and we see air, 3,500 to 7,500 feet per minute. Then we have foam, a hybrid of mud and air, 200 feet per minute. And then we get into specialty foams where we're a hundred feet per minute. What I want you to consider is the velocity is going to be directly impacting the soil that you're cutting. So if I'm in fine sands and gravel, if I do 3,500 feet per minute uphole velocity of air, how big can I erode that hole? Minimal impact. We want to make the hole that we've been given the project scope. If it's five inch, we want to make a five inch hole. We don't want to make a seven and a half inch hole and then finish with a five-ish inch at bottom. We've done damage. We're not going to have good hole stabilization. So if we think about uh, those solids deteriorating because my, my fluid method and my rotation is breaking them up and my penetration rate's too fast, you know, we start taking those quarters and we turn them into dimes. You know, and uh, the, the company guys on today, they're going, hey, look at all that money that we're, uh, we're starting to burn up. So when we see solids break down, you know, we're starting to make finer solids, which have more surface area, which means from a drilling fluid standpoint, there's more to coat, there's more to create as we come up out of the hole. For air, we need more velocity because we have more solids to push up past the bit and up out of the hole. So what happens? Our penetration rate slows down. We start losing polymers because we have more things to coat. Think about wrapping a polymer around that quarter versus wrapping that polymer around quarter inch size pieces. Then we lose pump efficiency because we have more surface area and we're starting to have that density come down on us. You know, uh, solids start building up, up down hole. Then it's just a domino effect. And as these start to happen, maybe the path of least resistance for all those cuttings is out into our formation. Maybe it's a water bearing formation and it's 
much permeable, and it's easier to push those out and cement off that formation that we needed to produce water out of. So what happens? We break that fracture gradient, we break that ground so it wants to go out, we start having cuttings come in, we have solids building up, we plug our bit, our pipe gets stuck, our hole destabilizes and it collapses. Now I just blew right through that, but consider that next time a drilling method is chosen and what size cuttings you can bring up out of the hole. Here's an annular velocity formulation for drilling fluids, mud. And you can go ahead and take a look at it, but I want you to consider at the end, if I have a 300 gallon a minute mud pump with three and a half inch drill rods, at a 10 inch bit, I have 83 feet per minute uphole velocity. And if you go back, you go, wait, we said 60 to 150 minutes. We're there. We're making good size cuttings coming up out of the hole. That's what we have to consider how the cuttings are evacuated, and how we keep that hole intact. So I always think about the, the space shuttle taking off and uh, the big boosters that are required to break our gravity. So if you think of a one inch size solid traveling at 60 feet per minute up hole, it's going to require a fluid that's moving greater than 60 feet per minute up hole. And we have to understand that at 60 feet, that's one minute to come up out of hole. I apologize for our international friends. If you uh, shoot me an email, I'm sure we can change this into uh, liters and meters, no problem. But I want you to consider, I need enough velocity to bring those cuttings to break that slip velocity and friction to get those cuttings to come up out. When we go below that, we have to slow our penetration rate. We have to slow, uh, we, we have to slow down, you know? And uh, beyond 60 feet per minute, we're just, uh, gravity is going to win every time. That brings us into bits and solids creation. So, uh, you know, a five inch bit is a gallon per foot, and you can go back and uh, run the equation on this. And a 10 inch bit, if you were thinking to yourself, it's two gallons per foot, you don't eat a lot of pizza. Because if you think of an eight inch personal size pizza to a large pizza that's 14 inch, boy, did that get big fast. So if we consider a 10 inch hole, it's four gallons per foot, and I'm uh, the oversight for the project that wants to think like my driller, I need to understand that 10 inch hole creates 0.54 cubic feet of material per foot, which in 50 feet is one cubic yard. And suddenly we have all of that to dispose of. So the next time we're designing a project or we're considering what's happening, we gotta fill that hole in or we gotta place product in it at the end, you know, going from a 10 inch to a 12 inch hole is a very important point to go from a half a cubic feet of material to a cubic feet of material in just two inches but it's pi r squared, right? So it's taking that radius out. So solids creation. You can see we can, uh, we can create a lot of different solids. We have a solids control unit on the left and that is a 10 inch hole to 200 feet. And you can see there's uh, quite a bit of material. Then you can see there's a desanding cone creating uh, sand sized particles and that's a pretty deep hole that we have that big mound of sand. What's affecting us down hole? Looking at our solids tells us a lot. Then you have a solids control unit on the far right. You know, that was a 12 inch hole. You can see creating great big shale sized solids coming off the shaker. Drilling fluids, drilling with air, wireline coring, um, large shaft diameter auger, all are going to take a different type of method. You can see we have a 20 foot diameter reverse circulation job for a coal mine there in the upper left. We have a project in the Atacama Desert. We have a water well. We have core recovery. It's all about applying the right method, understanding the time it's going to take, and bringing those cuttings out of the hole so we maintain the hole. So best drilling a method, equipment availability. If that piece of equipment's there, you make a phone call, you uh, have a discussion with your driller, some other industry professionals, we can likely make that piece of equipment work. Then it's about what type of geology, our time to completion, do I have days, weeks, months? What am I putting in the hole? What do I need to extract out? How much manpower do I have? And then site management, am I going to be able to leave this site the way it was with just a perfect little borehole with a piece of pipe sticking out of it? And then clean up and disposal. So practical field application is gonna start with you having candid communication with your drilling company so that you can understand how to think like them. This is the piece of equipment I'm gonna use. 
this is how we're going to do it, then we can start the collaboration. So here's a project, upper Midwest, nine and seven eighths inch hole. We didn't have a log before we showed up on the site and you can see, you know, uh, three feet seemed pretty easy. We encountered the water table, then we hit some sands, you know, mixed sand and gravel, hole stabilization, you know, and then two to 400 feet, very fragile sand. So what was our solution? It was mud rotary. You know, we, we understood what our uphole velocities were gonna be. We, uh, we phoned some friends and understood what would a good uh, fluid mix be. You know, we kept the whole volume, understood how much we were gonna create, and we had a good uphole velocity. You know, we were able to maintain that project by understanding the tool available we had and what we wanted to do. So if we jump to right here, we had fluids engineering and solids control. We have a, a student there, uh, Tatin, that's uh, checking our mud density. You can see there's a very basic kit and there's a solids control unit with big gravels coming out. So Western United States project, obviously it's not gonna be like our upper Midwest with our water, right? So it's a 12 inch by 800 feet. You know, we, uh, we had 10 foot of uh, sands and gravel, some overburden, and then boom, we got right into sandstone and then fractured rock with hard sections. And then we punched through that into a reactive shale. So what was our solution? Air, actually a combination. We ran a hammer where we could, and then we moved into foam drilling and was able to uh, keep that shale from reacting. And then when we got back into dense rock, we had to trip out and put on another hammer. So sometimes, the way we have to drill is multiple methods at once. Not at once, but multiple methods in the same hole. So it's very important to understand when I got into that fractured rock that uh, I needed something that was gonna be better stabilization. And we're uh, really great at considering what methods are gonna fit us in the United States. Now, when we start exploring, like my buddies with the Red Horse, you know, they have to drill a six inch hole to X depth and log every five feet and understand what's going to happen, you know, and then come up with the best plan of attack. So sometimes we need to draw a smaller pilot hole and understand how those materials are going to react. You know, in other projects, you can look the top down of all these irrigation wells in the Western US. There was reverse circulation used, there was hammer, there was mud rotary. You can see the Atagama Desert. We didn't have a lot of water. You know, we ended up using uh, great solids controls you know, uh, what's going to keep that hole open? Again, thinking like a driller is using the tools that are on hand. It's not about going, gee, I wish I had what they're using to drill this great big oil and gas project. It's about understanding our tools and using them to their specified limitations. So final thoughts from a driller. Immerse yourself in the project, get muddy, stay out of the danger zone when you can, but do everything you can to be part of that borehole creation. Stay alert. Understand what's going to be hoisted overhead. Go to the safety zone when possible. Question everything. Write it in your notebook. Go ask that driller at the end of the job. Contribute. Say, you know, I, I just heard about this new technology. Have you? You know, think about the collaboration of a new driller and an experienced driller and how we can be better as an industry together. Be prepared for the project completion. Be there. So if you gotta be there from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., it's very important to understand that. But being there in the middle of the day and then running off with lunch with the, the salesman and coming back as it finished, we miss some very crucial steps. I'm 38, I love this industry. The best advice I'd ever got was from Bob Brown and Rod Peterson and they said, document every failure just as much as successes. Understanding how we learn from the next project is very important. And that's very important from thinking like a driller to being a driller. Seek out innovation. I can't stress that enough. We have some amazing technologies out there. You know, and that comes back to Jack Welsh. An organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is an ultimate competitive advantage. Being the competitive advantage helps you be successful. I'd like to thank Versa Drill, Western Michigan University, uh, Geological Environmental Sciences and Whole Products. Um, 10 years ago, I worked with Versa Drill on my first training program for the United States military, and it was a 
great rewarding project and you know those guys helped put that together and helped create the trainer that I can be today. I train every summer with Western Michigan University and uh, that Hydro Field Camp is an invaluable tool for anyone. And then the whole products guys, you know when we said uh, it would be great if we could sponsor this whole deal so that you guys can use this as a tool nonstop. You know, the whole product said heck yes. You know, they're very knowledgeable staff and uh, just invaluable. And then thank you to you and uh, National Driller and BMP for allowing us to do something online and uh, have this, this live webinar. This is a different way for us to use this tool. We can share it with our people around the world. We can share it with new and old. And uh, it's a great tool for mentoring and it's a great tool to learn from. I appreciate your feedback. Please send us a note. Tell us how you uh, recepted this. So I've uh, come back in uh, and just a reminder, I'm Jeremy Verdusco, editor of National Driller, and uh, we're going to take a couple of questions. The big dog, uh, but National Driller. Take a couple of questions for uh, Brock. So um, how do you like being out on the job site? <laughs> uh, you know, growing up in this industry, I was on the job site, you know, and I, I got muddy and I, I shoveled pits and, you know, I, I got to have that learning curve. And then as I jumped out, into the industry with Bayroid and then uh, Labe Corporation and Jeffco and being a manufacturer, I used some of that insight that I had that was relative. And then the longer I was there, the, the more I realized behind the desk I was forgetting steps. And so being in the field is invaluable. Collaborating with the guys on the ground, the girls on the ground, and understanding what the next steps are working with our local regulators and our engineers and understanding all of our expectations, pulling that curtain back on our industry that's so very self-taught and letting everybody in on how we do it so we can do it better, it's just fantastic. Okay, so tell me about uh, what, what are some of the ways that communication can fail on a job site? You know, the, the biggest way communication fails is when we don't, right? And uh, in today's day and age, we have so many other ways to disengage on a job site from emails to phone calls to texting that if the expectation is to take samples every five feet or the expectation is is we really need to hit this depth we have to have that conversation you know uh, drilling is a complex science and we can be precise but it's about collaborating mm -hmm. and when we're scared to let somebody know that we don't know a terminology or engage on the job, job site, and this goes both ways for my mentor drillers out there and somebody that wants to think like a driller. We, hit, we put up this wall where we're, uh, they're just some manufacturer person and I gotta tell them everything. Yeah. And the manufacturer's going, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna tell them that I don't get why we're using the breakout wrench this way. But when we do it together, we make a better industry. So failing to make any questions known is our, our biggest fail. Okay, so this is a, a question from Irene in the audience. Uh, so what would a driller do in the case uh, that a work area that they're, they're in is rocky? So if, if, it's the work, if it's the actual job site that's rocky, you know, it's very important to understand what our, uh, our work scope is and if we have to come in and level the ground and make sure, you know, a quarter inch off, you know, at 100 feet, can be three to four feet in deviation. So it's very important to make sure our, our job site's level and clean. If it's downhole rockiness, making sure we have the right application. If it's uh, reverse circulation, so that we can bring out those big cobbles and keep that hole stabilized. If it's uh, running a dense drill fluid and talking to a local mud engineer, it's just important to uh, make sure we start with a good base on the ground that we can get into that other rocky material and stop it from actually falling into the hole. Okay, well I think that about wraps it up for today. Um, so this concludes today's webinar. Please join me in thanking Brock Yorty for his presentation, as well as our sponsors, Versadrill, Whole Products, and the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at Western Michigan University. 
please visit www.nationaldriller.com slash drill edu for the archive of this presentation as well as for information about our previous and upcoming webinars. We appreciate your time and hope you found this webinar to be a valuable experience. Thank you everybody.